Welcome back to Switch to Linux. Well, it is a new month, and that means that Linux Mint has given us another update to their blog, and we like covering these when they first come out. It is tradition at this channel. Of course, I use Linux Mint as my primary go-to distribution. It is the one that I recommend most people try out if they are just switching over to Linux now. Uh, you should give that one a try if you are in doubt, because it's works. It has a lot of uh, stability, a lot of support behind it, and it works with a large variety of different computers. So let's go ahead and have a look at the new report. The first is they are uh, giving us a little bit of data about their package repositories. And, and as I, uh, from my understanding, it looks like I was correct that um, if you are, the, the way they have their, their data configured on the new Fastly servers or the things, it appears as though that they can use that as a means to monitor uh, some information. So, of course, as a person that doesn't like to see much data analytics at all, uh, as long as they're doing it well, that's fine. I don't know the details about it, but being as they have a massive track record of privacy, I'm going to probably at this point in time assume the best. You know, this isn't like Microsoft or somebody. Uh, so, and I also, the company that they are using has full configurability, so they have the ability to not record IP addresses or things like that. And so uh, what we're seeing from the first figure is just a little bit about their their bandwidth. They're trying to figure out what uh, what is the response time. They're trying to figure out the bandwidth. They're trying to figure out how many connections, what their peak times are. What they're trying to figure out here is how to get the new CDN-based data repository online. Now, also, as my if my thought is correct, if you change off of the default Linux Mint, you wouldn't be involved in this at all. We don't have a lot of information about this, but that's kind of what my assumption is, based on what the data is, uh, reading through the documentation for the company that they're doing. So, it would appear if you don't want to be included in their data at all, just don't use the default Linux Mint repository, but they're also trying to make the Linux Mint repository one of the best to use. And with this, they're using data to figure figure out how much money it would cost them, how to best deploy it, and things like that. So that's what's going on with their data. Now moving on to some changes in the next version of Linux Mint. Uh, the software manager has some changes. So it's going to install, uh, it's going to have a lot, a lot of uh, faster loading times before the main window will appear. So that's one of the things that's lags out, not just on Linux Mint Software Manager, but on every one of them. In fact, I think the absolute worst is the GNOME Software Manager. That thing is so abos abysmally garbage, yet it's the one that does at least work on nearly every single distribution. So I was like, oh, if I need to use it, I will. Linux Mint is a little bit better. Now, what they're doing with these improvements is you'll remember that Flatpak has just done a lot of making uh, sure that people know what is verified and what is unverified. So now the software manager will not show unverified Flatpaks by default. You'll have to go into the settings and toggle this on. Let me take a small parenthetical because somebody had asked in the comments recently because there are a lot of people switching to Linux and a lot of people on the channel may not know what the difference is. We're going to do a full comprehensive video about this, talk about different ways of packaging uh, software in Linux. But let me just tell you very briefly, what is a flat pack? Because as our commenter had asked in a recent video, I use the word flat pack without defining what this is. So in Linux, the traditional way that software is packaged is Linux has a lot of dependencies for different software. And then there is a package which has to call these different dependencies. This has classically led to what has been termed dependency hell because the dependencies are separate from the software applications. Although most of us, more Linux purists, we still tend to prefer that way of distribution and it doesn't usually cause as many problems as it used to. Now, what there's three ways of packaging software that works for Linux now, which has seeks to tackle this problem. One of those is Snap, one of those is Flatpak, and one of those is AppImage. All of these will bundle their dependencies and other core files together with themselves so that you don't have that issue because you download the software package and it comes with the dependencies built in. This carries with it a major advantage that if your dependencies are slightly different than those in your repository, you can still 
have a flat pack that works well on a system that may not otherwise work. It comes with a downside if it takes a lot more bandwidth to download and a lot more disk space to store. And flat pack does carry with it a lot of different uh, uh, different uh, updates that make it all work. And that has become a little bit of a problem for some people looking at flat packs going, you turn on and there's updates every single couple of hours and it's really annoying and frustrating. So flat pack basically is a way of pre-packaging software for a Linux distribution that is not dependent on the distribution and it is not dependent on the various dependencies in that distribution. So it is a more consistent way to run software across the Linux ecosystem. So we'll get into that and uh, once again what they're doing here is they're going to they're going to disable unverified flat pack. So remember an unverified flat pack is simply a flat pack that is put into the flat packs repository by somebody other than the original developer of the application itself. So if LibreOffice makes LibreOffice, but LibreOffice company that makes it decides they don't want to package a flat pack, but somebody else says, well, I'll do that because it's open source code. There's nothing that prevents somebody else from grabbing that software package and putting it in the flat pack repository. But an unverified app, if the developer of the software is not the one who packages the software, it gets the unverified tag. So, of course, this is good in many ways. This is bad in many ways. Some developers just don't want to deal with it. So other very reputable people have taken different software and put it in Flatpak and it's not verified, but it is still there and it is still the exact correct software. The assumption behind this is that the actual developer is not going to do anything wonky, whereas some third party could sneak something else in there and uh, you know hope that somebody doesn't catch it. So this is really good to really clean up the uh, the flat packs. This is something Snap has done uh, as well. Flat packs doing it. And app images are a completely different beast that we won't cover in this video. We'll talk about it in a later time. So you also have the option down here to avoid potential malware. Strongly recommended uh, to use the uh, not to use them. This is a problem. Now, when an app has multiple formats, there's uh, presumably there's a drop down here, and um, it. Let me see if I. Don't, remember they I don't remember if they actually had anything about this uh, presumably here it sets the default so if something is available in repository and in flat pack what is the default I'm guessing that that's what that one does so that is there so here is an example of Google Chrome so Google Chrome does not uh, Google does not actually package the flat pack, although you can get it. So you'll see that Google Chrome is not verified. What they've said here is that unverified flat packs do not feature any reviews and do not have a score. And so it is very clear what is unverified versus something that is verified. It would say verified up here with a green check mark. And then you can see what the item is over here. And somewhere on here, it should tell you who actually packaged it. Uh, it might be under the details. That would be useful information because, yeah, you might know some of these developers. It's okay, I know Bob Smith, the developer. I'm going to trust something he does. But uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I'm a scammer. XYZ. Please install my flat pack. You know, I don't know that guy. And I, he just sounds a little shady to me. So we're not going to do that. All right, if you've missed it from last month's update, uh, they did switch over in Matrix. I was actually responding over there with some things on Matrix as I was looking at uh, doing a video of installing Linux Mint onto a USB drive. And I found there were a few complications with doing that, protecting your main drive. Uh, so I was actually chatting with some people on the Matrix server as well to verify other people have noted that. And yes, several of us have noted that the select a drive to install to does not fix the bootloader issues. But all that communication is going on on Matrix, so you can find the Matrix channel just by searching for Linux Mint in the public directories. And then you can jump on over there, and there are a lot of really knowledgeable and very friendly people over there. So you can jump on over there. Of course, don't forget our Matrix server as well. Uh, so we don't have nearly as many. And I don't know, we might be more friendly. We might not be. I don't know. It depends upon whom you would ask. But you can find us also on Switch to Linux. But Linux Mint does have this. They said they have 600 members in Linux Mint space, 2,400 in the main channel. And they are helping support each other. And it's also they're finding the uh, the Matrix channel has facilitated discussions between other people. 
And the final point is just a comment on GTK, Libedweda, Edweda, and XAP. So this was something that we discussed in last month's video, and it caused a lot of discussion as it seems in many ways that GNOME is moving to a uh, desktop dependent platform. And so it's starting to take its toys and go home and pretty much lock you into that ecosystem. Some people love that. Some people hate that. It is what it is. But that discussion caused a lot of internal discussions between a lot of developers. And that's always a positive thing. So they say here, the concerns voiced last month about GTK, Adweda, and Live Adweda were heard. Uh, they heard by many projects, including upstream apps, desktop environments, and distributions, led to many discussions with a huge number of developers involved. And he uh, wants to stress here the facts that some of these discussions involve GNOME developers and are very constructive. So even the GNOME developers are in on these. They did say, however, no big decisions or solutions emerged as to this. Uh, so on the issues of cross-DE compatibility and independence from the GNOME project, there is also consensus on the idea of working together on common technology. So people are still working together, although GNOME is trying to become a little bit more of an independent standalone project. So there is our updates from Clem on Linux Mint, what is new. Uh, mostly just a, a change this week to the software manager is the, the big change there. So uh, keep an eye out for the latest updates. And thank you guys for watching. I hope that you enjoy switching to Linux.